A Cynic Looks at Life by Ambrose Bierce. Section 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Cynic Looks at Life by Ambrose Bierce. Section 3. Immortality. The desire for life everlasting has commonly been affirmed to be universal. At least that is the view taken by those unacquainted with Oriental faiths and with Oriental character. Those of us whose knowledge is a trifle wider are not prepared to say that the desire is universal nor even general. If the devout Buddhist, for example, wishes to live always, he has not succeeded in very clearly formulating the desire. The sort of thing that he is pleased to hope for is not what we should call life, and not what many of us would care for. When a man says that everybody has a horror of annihilation, we may be very sure that he has not many opportunities for observation, or that he has not availed himself of all that he has. Most persons go to sleep rather gladly, yet sleep is virtual annihilation while it lasts. And if it should last forever, the sleeper would be no worse off after a million years of it than after an hour of it. There are minds sufficiently logical to think of it that way, and to them annihilation is not a disagreeable thing to contemplate and expect. In this matter of immortality, people's beliefs appear to go along with their wishes. The man who is content with annihilation thinks he will get it. Those that want immortality are pretty sure they are immortal. And that is a very comfortable allotment of faiths. The few of us that are left unprovided for are those who do not bother themselves much about the matter, one way or another. The question of human immortality is the most momentous that the mind is capable of conceiving. If it is a fact that the dead live, all other facts are in comparison trivial and without interest. The prospect of obtaining certain knowledge with regard to this stupendous matter is not encouraging. In all countries but those in barbarism, the powers of the profoundest and most penetrating intelligences have been ceaselessly addressed to the task of glimpsing a life beyond this life. Yet today no one can truly say that he knows. It is as much a matter of faith as ever it was. Our modern Christian nations profess a passionate hope and belief in another world. Yet the most popular writer and speaker of his time, the man whose lectures drew the largest audiences, the work of whose pen brought him the highest rewards, was he who most strenuously strove to destroy the ground of that hope and unsettle the foundations of that belief. The famous and popular Frenchman, professor of spectacular astronomy, Camille Flammarion, affirms immortality because he has talked with departed souls who said that it was true. Yes, monsieur. But surely you know the rule about hearsay evidence. We Anglo-Saxons are very particular about that, M. Flammarion says. I don't repudiate the presumptive arguments of schoolmen. I merely supplement them with something positive. For instance, if you assumed the existence of God, this argument of the scholastics is a good one. God has implanted in all men the desire of perfect happiness. This desire cannot be satisfied in our lives here. If there were not another life wherein to satisfy it, then God would be a deceiver. Voila tout. There is more. The desire of perfect happiness does not imply immortality, even if there is a God. For one, God may not have implanted it, but merely suffers it to exist as he suffers sin to exist. The desire of wealth the desire to live longer than we do in this world. It is not held that God implanted all the desires of the human heart. Then why hold that he implanted that of perfect happiness? 2. Even if he did, 
even if a divinely implanted desire entail its own gratification, even if it cannot be gratified in this life, that does not imply immortality. It implies only another life long enough for its gratification just once. An eternity of gratification is not a logical inference from it. 3. Perhaps God is a deceiver. Who knows that he is not? Assumption of the existence of a God is one thing. Assumption of the existence of a God who is honorable and candid according to our conception of honor and candor is another. 4. There may be an honorable and candid God. He may have implanted in us the desire of perfect happiness. It may be, it is, impossible to gratify that desire in this life. Still, another life is not implied, for God may not have intended us to draw the inference that he is going to gratify it. If omniscient and omnipotent, God must be held to have intended whatever occurs, but no such God is assumed in M. Flammarion's illustration. And it may be that God's knowledge and power are limited, or that one of them is limited. M. Flammarion is a learned, if somewhat theatrical, astronomer. He has a tremendous imagination, which naturally is more at home in the marvelous and catastrophic than in the orderly regions of familiar phenomena. To him, the heavens are an immense pyrotechnicon, and he is the master of the show and sets off the fireworks. But he knows nothing of logic, which is the science of straight thinking, and his views of things have therefore no value. They are nebulous. Nothing is clearer than that our pre-existence is a dream, having absolutely no basis in anything that we know or can hope to know. Of after existence, there is said to be evidence, or rather testimony, in assurances of those who are in present enjoyment of it, if it is enjoyable. Whether this testimony has actually been given, and it is the only testimony worth a moment's consideration, is a disputed point. Many persons living this life profess to have received it, but nobody professes, or ever has professed, to have received a communication of any kind from one in actual experience of the forelife. The souls, as yet ungarmented, if such there are, are dumb to question. The land beyond the grave has been, if not observed, yet often and variously described, if not explored and surveyed, yet carefully charted. From among so many accounts of it that we have, he must be fastidious indeed who cannot be suited. But of the fatherland that spreads before the cradle, the great heretofore, wherein we all dwelt, if we are to dwell in the hereafter, we have no account. Nobody professes knowledge of that. No testimony reaches our ears of flesh concerning its topographical or other features. No one has been so enterprising as to wrest from its actual inhabitants any particulars of their character and appearance. And among educated experts and professional proponents of worlds to be there is a general denial of its existence. I am of their way of thinking about that. The fact that we have no recollection of a former life is entirely conclusive of the matter. To have lived an unrecollected life is impossible and unthinkable for there would be nothing to connect the new life with the old. No thread of continuity, nothing that persisted from one life to the other. The later birth would be that of another person, an altogether different being, unrelated to the first, a new John Smith succeeding the late Tom Jones. Let us not be misled here by a false analogy. Today I might get a thwacko the mazard, which will give me an intervening season of unconsciousness between yesterday and tomorrow. Thereafter, I may live to a green old age with no recollection of anything that I knew or did or was before the accident. Yet I shall be the same person, for between the old life and the new, there will be a nexus, a thread of continuity, 
something spanning the gulf from the one state to the other, and the same in both, namely my body with its habits, capacities, and powers. That is I. That identifies me to others as my former self, authenticates and credentials me as the person that incurred the cranial mischance dislodging memory. But when death occurs, all is dislodged if memory is. For between two merely mental or spiritual existences, memory is the only nexus conceivable. Consciousness of identity is the only identity. To live again without memory of having lived before is to live another. Re-existence without recollection is absurd. There is nothing to re-exist. Emancipated Woman What I should like to know is how the enlargement of woman's sphere by her entrance into various activities of commercial, professional, and industrial life benefits the sex. It may please Helen Gauger and satisfy her sense of logical accuracy to say, as she does, we women must work in order to fill the places left vacant by liquor-drinking men. But who filled these places before? Did they remain vacant? Or were there then disappointed applicants as now? If my memory serves, there has been no time in the period that it covers when the supply of workers, abstemious male workers, was not in excess of the demand. That it has always been so is sufficiently attested by the universally inadequate wage rate. Employers seldom fail, and never for long, to get all the workmen they need. The field into which women have put their sickles was already overcrowded with reapers. Whatever employment women have obtained has been got by displacing men who would otherwise be supporting women. Where is the general advantage? We may shout high tariff, combination of capital, demonetization of silver, and whatnot, but if searching for the cause of augmented poverty and crime, industrial discontent and the tramp evil, instead of dogmatically expounding it, we should take some account of this enormous, sudden addition to the number of workers seeking work. If any one thinks that within the brief period of a generation, the visible supply of labor can be enormously augmented without profoundly affecting the stability of things and disastrously touching the interests of wage workers, let no rude voice dispel his dream of such maleficent agencies as his slumberous understanding may joy to affirm. And let our widows of Asher unlung themselves in advocacy of quack remedies for evils of which themselves are cause. It remains true that when the contention of two lions for one bone is exacerbated by the ascension of a lioness, the squabble is not composable by stirring up some bears in the cage adjacent. Indubitably, a woman is under no obligation to sacrifice herself to the good of her sex by foregoing needed employment in the hope that it may fall to a man gifted with dependent women. Nevertheless, our congratulations are more intelligent when bestowed upon her individual head than when sifted into the hair of all Eve's daughters. This is a world of complexities in which the lines of interest are so intertangled as frequently to transgress that of sex, and one ambitious to help out but half the race may profitably know that every effort to that end provokes a counterbalancing mischief. The enlargement of woman's opportunities has benefited individual women. It has not benefited the sex as a whole, and has distinctly damaged the race. The mind that cannot discern a score of great and irreparable general evils distinctly traceable to emancipation of woman is as impregnable to the light as a toad in a rock. A marked demerit of the new order of things, the regime of female commercial service, is that its main advantage accrues not to the race, not to the sex, not to the class, 
not to the individual woman, but to the person of least need and worth, the male employer. Female employers in any considerable number there will not be, but those that we have could give the male ones profitable instruction in grinding the faces of their employees. This constant increase of the army of labor, always and everywhere too large for the work in sight, by accession of a new contingent of natural oppressibles, makes the very teeth of old money glut thrill with a poignant delight. It brings in that situation known as two laborers seeking one job, and one of them a person whose bones he can easily grind to make his bread. And Munaglut is a miller of skill and experience, dusted all over with the evidence of his useful craft. When heaven has assisted the daughters of hope to open to women a new avenue of opportunities, the first to enter and walk therein, like God in the Garden of Eden, is the good Mr. Moneyglut, contentedly smoothing the folds out of the superior slope of his paunch, exuding the peculiar aroma of his oleaginous personality, and larding the new roadway with the overflow of a righteousness stimulated to action by relish of his own identity. And ever thereafter, the subtle suggestion of a fat philistinism lingers along that path of progress like an assertion of a possessory right. It is God's own crystal truth that in dealing with women unfortunate enough to be compelled to earn their own living, and fortunate enough to have wrested from fate an opportunity to do so, men of business and affairs treat them with about the same delicate consideration that they show to dogs and horses of the inferior breeds. It does not commonly occur to the wealthy professional man or prominent merchant to be ashamed to add to his yearly thousands a part of the salary justly due to his female bookkeeper or typewriter, who sits before him all day with an empty belly in order to have a habilimented back. He has a vague, hazy notion that the law of supply and demand is mandatory and that in submitting himself to it by paying her a half of what he would have to pay a man of inferior efficiency is supplying the world with a noble example of obedience. I must take the liberty to remind him that the law of supply and demand is not imperative. It is not a statute, but a phenomenon. He may reply, it is imperative. The penalty for disobedience is failure. If I pay more in salaries and wages than I need to, my competitor will not. And with that advantage, he will drive me from the field. If his margin of profit is so small that he must eke it out by coining the sweat of his workmen into nickels, I've nothing to say to him. Let him adopt in peace the motto, I cheat to eat. I do not know why he should eat, but nature, who has provided sustenance for the worming sparrow, the sparrowing owl, and the owling eagle, approves the needy man of prey and makes a place for him at table. Human nature is pretty well balanced. For every lacking virtue, there is a rough substitute that will serve at a pinch. As cunning is the wisdom of the unwise, and ferocity the courage of the coward. Nobody is altogether bad. The scoundrel, who has grown rich, by underpaying workmen in his factory, will sometimes endow an asylum for indigent seamen. To oppress one's own workmen and provide for the workmen of a neighbor, to skin those in charge of one's own interest while cottoning and oiling the residuary product of another's skinnery, that is not very good benevolence, nor very good sense, but it serves in place of both. The man who eats pâté de foie gras in the sweat of his girl cashier's face, or wears purple and fine linen in order that his typewriter may have an eocene gown and a pliocene hat, seems a tolerably satisfactory specimen of the genus thief. But let us not forget that in his own home, a fairly good one, he may enjoy and merit that highest and most honorable title on the scroll of women's favor. 
a good provider. One having a claim that glittering distinction should enjoy immunity from the coarse and troublesome question, from whose backs and bellies do you provide? So much for the material results to the sex. What are the moral results? One does not like to speak of them, particularly to those who do not and cannot know. To good women, in whose innocent minds female immorality is inseparable from flashy gowning and the painted face. To foolish, book-taught men, who honestly believe in some protective sanctity that hedges womanhood. If men of the world, with years enough to have lived out of the old regime into the new, would testify in this matter, there would ensue a great rattling of dry bones in bodices of reform ladies. Nay, if the young man about town, knowing nothing of how things were in the dark backward and abysm of time, but something of the moral distance between even so free-running a creature as the society girl and the average working girl of the factory, the shop and the office would speak out under assurance of immunity from prosecution. His testimony would be a surprise to the cartilaginous virgins, blousy matrons, acrid relics, and hairy males of emancipation. It would pain, too, some very worthy but unobservant persons not in sympathy with the cause. Certain significant facts are within the purview of all but the very young and the comfortably blind. To the woman of today, the man of today is perfectly impolite. In place of reverence, he gives her deference. To the language of compliment has succeeded the language of raillery. Men have almost forgotten how to bow. Doubtless the advanced female prefers the new manner, as may some of her less forward sisters, thinking it more sincere. It is not our giddy grandfather talked high-flown nonsense because his heart had tangled his tongue. He treated his woman more civilly than we ours because he loved her better. He never had seen her on the rostrum and in the lobby never had heard her in the advocacy of herself, never had read her confessions of his sins, never had felt the stress of her competition, nor himself assisted by daily personal contact in rubbing the bloom off her. He did not know that her virtues were due to her secluded life, but thought, dear old boy, that they were a gift of God. A Mad World let us suppose that in tracing its secloidal curves through the unthinkable reaches of space traversed by the solar system, our planet should pass through a belt of attenuated matter having the property of dementing us. It is a conception easily enough entertained that space is full of malign conditions incontinuously distributed, that we are one time traversing a zone comparatively innocuous and at another spinning through a region of infection, that away behind us in the wake of our swirling flight are fields of plague and pain still agitated by our passage through them. All this is as good as known. It is almost as certain as it is that in our little annual circle round the sun are points at which we are stoned and brick-batted like a pig in a potato patch pelted with little nodules of meteoric metal, flung like gravel, and bombarded with gigantic masses hurled by God knows what. What strange adventures await us in those yet untraveled regions toward which we speed? In what malign conditions may we not at any time plunge? To the strength and stress of what frightful environment may we not at last succumb? The subject lends itself readily enough to a jest, but I am not jesting. It is really altogether probable that our solar system, racing through space with inconceivable velocity, will one day enter a region charged with something deleterious to the human brain, minding us all madwise. By the way, dear reader, did you ever happen to consider the possibility that you are a lunatic and perhaps confined in an asylum? 
it seems to you that you are not that you go with freedom where you will and use a sweet reasonableness in all your works and ways but to many a lunatic it seems that he is Ramesses the second or the whole car of indoor many a plunging maniac ironed to the floor of a cell believes himself the goddess of liberty careering gaily through the ten commandments in a chariot of gold of your own sanity and identity you have no evidence that is any better than he has of his more accurately i have none of mine for anything i know you do not exist nor any one of all the things with which i think myself familiarly conscious all may be fictions of my disordered imagination i really know but one reason for doubting that i am an inmate of an asylum for the insane namely the probability that there is nowhere any such thing as an asylum for the insane this kind of speculation has charms that get a good neck hold upon attention for example if i am really a lunatic and the persons and things that i seem to see about me have no objective existence what an ingenious though disordered imagination i must have what a clever coup it was to invent mr rockefeller and clothe him with the attribute of permanence with what amusing qualities i have endowed my laird of skibbo philanthropist what a masterpiece of creative humor is my fatty taft statesman taking himself seriously even solemnly and persuading others to do the same and this city of washington with its motley population of silurians parv noodles and scamps pranking unashamed in the light of day and its saving contingent of the forsaken righteous their seed begging bread did rabelais exuberant fancy ever conceive so but rabelais is perhaps himself a conception surely he has no common maniac who has wrought out of nothing the history the philosophies sciences arts laws religions politics and morals of this imaginary world nay the world itself tumbling uneasily through space like a beetle's ball is no mean achievement and i am proud of it but the mental feat in which i take most satisfaction and which i doubt not is most diverting to my keepers is that of creating mr w r hurst pointing his eyes toward the white house and endowing him with a perilous jacksonian ambition to defile it the hearst is distinctly a treasure on the whole i have done i think tolerably well and when i contemplate the fertility and originality of my inventions the queer unearthliness and grotesque actions of the characters whom i have evolved isolated and am cultivating I cannot help thinking that if heaven had not made me a lunatic, my peculiar talent might have made me an entertaining writer. End of section three.